say four words to you now that will rend the very fabric of reality. I love Quest 64, and what's more I give less than a five second broom closet fuck who knows it is the story of the drizzling shits. Well first you need to stop implying that it has one. Oh! And don't you dare write this fictive vacuum off as minimalist. Quest 64's narrative is somewhat minimalistic in the same way that outer fucking space is sort of big and cold. Why mention a largely forgettable Nintendo 64 RPG at the outset of a Parasite Eve retrospective? Well, because this game stole Quest 64's battle system and there is simply no way around. It. And they picked the appropriate plunder, too, because the vast majority of the game eats ass with bare hands. Quest 64's battle system is the ninth inning walk-off home run when your team is losing 20 to fucking 2. But it also illustrates with aplomb that even in the late 90s, the tired, turn-based tropes of yore were a crutch for complacent, entitled Eastern game designers riding high in the pre-rendered PlayStation hog, and it took a game like Parasite Eve to show the industry just how far they'd fallen. The Japanese RPG developers elected to ignore this newly emerging innovation and spin their wheels in place until the creative well was thoroughly sapped by the mid-2000s is, in my opinion, one of the most important and thoroughly underreported cautionary tales of contemporary gaming. And the battle system is as utterly superb as it is, serves only to punctuate a supremely engaging story that, unlike so many of its PS1 JRPG contemporaries, seems to know exactly how much melodrama is too much melodrama, and consistently pulls itself back from the brink of cloud strife bawling over the corpse of a dead chick he met five fucking minutes ago canyon. Yeah, I've never heard of that landmark either, but it's gotta exist, just look at all the merchandise. Effusive praise aside, don't confuse an engaging story for a perfect one. Parasite Eve, while timeless in its own unique way, is just as much a problem product of its time, namely the late 90s pseudo-scientific horror subgenre wherein we demolish the inherent terror of the supernatural by placing it under an electron microscope and over-explaining the bewildering fuck out of it. What are midichlorians? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. <laughs> A Dracula is a Dracula. Let me show you the deep, raw passion of unbridled sexual frenzy. But you see, I'm British. A wolfman is a wolfman. A goddamn werewolf. I don't need J. Robert Schlockenheimer breaking down the comprehensive history of the vampire genome from Protozoa to that afternoon Underworld film franchise. All Underworld needs to do is show me 17 unique angles of Kate Beckinsale's camel toe and shut the fuck up! Parasite Eve is perhaps the last greatest chapter in a once rich leather-bound tome entitled Times When Squaresoft Actually Moved the Fuck Forward. In a time when turn-based JRPGs were printing money, well fuck, let's try a real-time battle system. When the PS1 was swallowed whole by a deluge of amnesic male ellipses dispensaries masquerading as protagonists, well, let's try a strong, independent, fully clothed female character on for size. Is it any wonder that in 2014, while the half-naked redhead from Heavenly Sword with even less personality traits than clothing is considered a paragon of feminine fortitude, that the fetid remains of the Parasite Eve franchise are adorning a Japanese landfill somewhere, at a time when Ellen Page and her Adam's Apple nets every Best Supporting Character of the Century Award and Western Civilization for a succession of awkward pauses with Cletus the slack-jawed yokel in a fucking prison cell, are we seriously surprised the original incarnation of Aya Brea is persona non grata? If you aren't underage, snarky, and covered in dust and dog shit, you don't get to be a strong female video game character 
character in 2014. Full fucking stop! Being in a Sony exclusive helps, too. Funny how that works. Throw in a soundtrack so unremittingly badass, I have to believe it inspired Akira Yamaoka when he produced the soundtrack of a budding horror franchise you may have heard of called Silent Fucking Hill. modern and steeped in boundless atmosphere, Yoko Shimomura, one of the elite few female video game composers, produced arguably the finest single chapter in the Godiva fucking rich library of PS1 era soundtracks. Where I go from mild arousal to nursing an unabashedly protuberant erection the size and scope of which interferes with local cell phone reception is in the area of customization. I could and have fucked around with applying bonus points, weapon mods, and damage and defense modifiers for untold goddamn hours. For my money, it's the more subtle alterations like this that take a more traditional JRPG, which mechanically speaking usually shares more in common with turn-based strategy games than D&D, and elevates it not just to a full-on fucking role-playing game, but one that readily departs from the pack as a definitive cornerstone of the genre. Parasite Eve is a cornerstone, but more than that, it's still a fuck of a lot of fun to play, even having weathered the turpitudes and calamities of the interim decade and a half. Five gratuitous shower scenes out of five. If you don't play it, rest secure the knowledge that you're a contrarian cunt. I think gamers should have been more alarmed by Parasite Eve 2 than they perhaps ultimately were. Hey, hey guys, can you tell Resident Evil 2 was more popular than God in 1998, guys? Can you tell Squaresoft looked at the successful new horror series, noted that his budding new RPG franchise shared a trifling handful of shallow cosmetic similarities, and consequently chucked easily a third of the original masterpiece into the game design incinerator to make way for a fairly vapid imitation of Capcom's seminal zombie title, following Ayabrea's climactic battle on a missile carrier with a levitating satanic baby with an undulous comically oversized scrotum, because Japan, she's relocated to Raccoon <coughs> Los Angeles and been recruited to a quasi-secretive, supernaturally inclined, acronym-centric subset of the FBI known as the Star- <coughs> Mist. Y y yes, f fucking Mist. Whereupon she must investigate the recent outbreak of some sort of biohazard called the T-Vibe- <coughs> Neo-mitochondrial syndrome, with her every clunky tank-controlled step being doggedly pursued by a hulking, relentless, hyper-intelligent super mutant named Nemesis- <coughs> Number nine, Gollum. Come original, you got to come original. Our entertainers come original. And I certainly hope you like graham cracker crust and type 2 diabetes because it's time for some fucking cheesecake. Shoehorn fully nude shower scenes, mandatory outfit changes, each more revealing and impractical than the last. <laughs> Look at all them hot pants. And a double ration of impossibly forced late 90s bad girl sass, and I has gone from a quiet and contemplative determined professional to stripperella without the satire. I mean, that'd be like, um... Oh, I don't know, for no narratively compatible reason, giving Jill Redfield a pair of D-cup tits, a needlessly plunging neckline, and an inexplicably blonde haircut. Oh, fuck right off, Capcom! But change isn't the chief offender where Parasite Eve 2 is concerned. There are at least a dozen ways that Parasite Eve could have easily evolved to objectively improve its already exceptional action RPG format. Party members, dual wielding, armor that's actually represented on screen fucking visually, but what becomes repulsively evident over the course of Parasite Eve Part Dieu is that Square Microsoft's developmental modus operandi was that if it was not featured in Resident Evil 2, it is not worth fucking stealing. Up to it including easily the single greatest affront to your thumbs in all of Christendom. Those mother fucking tank controls. If you weren't raised in the PS1 N64 regime, it is near an impossibility to sufficiently convey how exhilarating it felt to play a game with the movement controls of the first Parasite Eve after years of unceasing servitude to the tank control tyrant. Are Parasite Eve 1's controls flawed? 
wall as fuck no? Is IS running velocity somewhere between freeze-dried snail and Yahtzee's wit without a script? Sure it fucking is, but at least up means up and left means left. When a gaggle of ravenous vampire bats are monging on my karate, the last thing I need to be is fumble fucking around with my tank control movement decoder ring. How you assess Parasite Eve 2's long-term quality varies greatly depending on which vantage point you stand on while formulating said judgment. Take it as a sequel to Parasite Eve, itself easily the single most refreshing and innovative chapter in the hallowed halls of 90s Squaresoft, it's a disappointment to rival the Hindenburg. Judged as a survival horror title in the painstakingly Xeroxed vein of Capcom's eminently more successful Resident Evil series, well, you have to doff hat and concede that the game is an infinitely deeper, more nuanced approach to the genre, albeit one with very few legitimately memorable fucking scares. Unless, of course, you find the mere act of baddies jumping out at you at regularly scheduled intervals to be frightening, in which case may I suggest you securely fasten your adult diapers and imbibe in the emotionally scarring psychological horror affectations of fucking Contra, asshole. Four gratuitous shower scenes out of five. Square Enix, okay? Yeah, yeah, I can practically hear the Squeenix Defense Society now. B but Razor Fist, this is technically not a Parasite Eve title. It's just marketed to look that way. It's a delightful corporate compromise for devoted longtime fans. Yeah, sure, it Chuckles, and a gunshot wound is just a 44 caliber hello. Make no mistake, the third birthday is not a Parasite Eve game. Not merely due to the absence of the brand name for legal reasons, but because it is abundantly clear while scaling this leaning tower of regret that it was erected for one reason and one one reason alone, because some leering asshole at Square Enix had an idea for a third-person shooter with a ham-fisted time-traveling possession mechanic crammed in its tailpipe, and in lieu of generating their first new idea of the millennium, Square did what Square does and slapped the name of a beloved IP on the cover to financially exploit their hapless fan base. An overdive mechanic that rapidly disintegrates into a standby deus ex machina as Aya repeatedly embroils herself in near-death experience after near-death experience, only to evade the Grim Reaper like some glowing, fully nude mystery. Mr. Magoo. Sadder still is that despite Square Enix losing the Parasite Eve license, and therefore being legally compelled to downplay the mitochondrial pseudoscience overtones, this didn't have to be a fucking horrific video game. After the breakout success of the original, you had three directions to take the series in. After all, Parasite Eve was a three-way split of horror, action, and RPG. You've already done horror, and while Parasite Eve 2 is far from terrible, by and large the audience farted at it. You've done action and wound up with the third birthday, arguably one of the most monumental financial catastrophes in the unyielding parade of financial catastrophes known as the PSP Game Library. I mean, do I have to draft a fucking diagram for you, Square Enix? Literally, the only avenue of game design you have yet to fully pursue is motherfucking role-playing. Destiny is destiny. And even graded by the outlandishly forgiving criteria of third-person shooters, every polygon in this game is mediocrity squared, even down to the simple act of firing a fucking gun. I mean, where's the god damn impact! <laughs> That's right, I went there. I mean, I'm firing a shotgun, a fucking shotgun, folks, at point-blank range. What is this thing loaded with fucking cotton? Whether I'm brandishing a sniper rifle or lobbing a rocket-propelled grenade, there's simply nothing resembling impact in even the most remedial firefight. Fuck, apart from a mild case of Parkinson's, there's very little effect of any description on the waifish 20-something woman who's wielding the goddamn weapon, let alone the super tanker-sized kaiju monster she's pointing the fucking thing at. How Japanese is this game? Well, you start the game with an equipable French maid's outfit, and the plot revolves around the entire city of New York being tentacle raped. Does that answer your question? Literally, the lone bright spot in the nebulous Stygian black hole that is the third birthday is the welcome return of Yoko Shimomura to a Parasite Eve soundtrack. Alternately tense, contemplative, and thick with her trademark sense of atmospherics, this game's soundtrack remains the sole reason to so much as broach the fucking subject of this shit piece. And even then, only as a suffix of the phrase, hey, I know that game was so unrelentingly bullshit it rendered us both quadriplegics, but an infinitely 
better soundtrack than this travesty frankly deserves. The Third Birthday, a terrible action game, a horror title that's horrifying for all the wrong reasons, and an unqualified fucking embarrassment to the memory of the once great Parasite Eve franchise. One gratuitous shower scene out of five, and yes, if it weren't for the titties, that number would be zero. I'm Razorfist, God fucking speed.